Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trauma Recovery Summit. I'm David Jacks, your host. I have with me today Darlene Lancer. Darlene is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's been doing it for over 30 years. She's also an author. She's written 10 books, including books on dating, loving and leaving a narcissist, conquering shame and codependency, uh, codependency for dummies, including 10 steps to self and 10 steps to self-esteem, how to speak your mind, how to become assertive and set limits and setting boundaries. It go, the list goes on and on. <laughs> Very accomplished, esteemed uh, author and therapist, Darlene Lancer. Her website is whatiscodependency.com. And there you can get a free copy of 14 Tips for Letting Go. Uh, she's a sought after speaker in the media at professional conferences. You can find her on SoundCloud, Clip, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Welcome, Darlene. Thank you very much for having me speak to your audience. I'm looking forward to it. Well, so. thank you for being here. Um, and you hit on a number of really interesting topics. Um, what would you say? Um, so you've been doing this for over 30 years, right? We had obviously a major event with the pandemic. And how would you say things are now with your clients versus pre-COVID? What's, what's changed? What's different, if any? Well, I don't think it's my clients have changed. Um, during the pandemic, there was um, people that were in abusive relationships felt trapped. Mm. It's harder to get away. There was more divorces. Abuse escalated. It was hard to set boundaries, you know, when you're forced to be quarantined together. You can't get away. You can't escape. You can't go see your friends um, for support. So that was all harder. Yeah. And uh, things now are returning to normal. But I had a few clients that were single and that were relieved because they liked isolating <laughs> and now <they're> like <laughs> validated and everybody was doing it they didn't yeah. like socializing so it was normalizing their normal you know withdrawal behavior and do you do do you do more work with couples or, or singles um actually i work more with singles and you i do. think it's because i recommend when someone's in an abusive relationship mm -hmm that they seek individual therapy. Usually an abuser or a narcissist will want to use the therapy to um, blame and shame uh, uh, their partner and often lie. And a lot of uh, therapists can get um, seduced by, by that and not realize what's happening. And I've had people come to me and say that the, the the narcissist or the abuser just took over and either stormed out or used the whole session to find fault with them uh, and lied and denied things. So it's not very productive. And I tell people that you can change the relationship by changing yourself because all relationships are a system. It's a dynamic. Mm -hmm. And my book, Dating, Loving, and Leaving a Narcissist, and what I teach people is how to take your power back. Mm. And I have personal experience with this because I live with an abusive alcoholic oh, okay. in my marriage for 17 years and by 12-step uh, meetings and, and therapy, I was able to turn that around and those skills uh, benefited me when I left. But, you know, <laughs> your seminar is about healing trauma. And I mistakenly thought at that time when I left the abuser that that was it. <laughs> I had done my work yeah. and, you know, but little did I know that the trauma remains just like if you've gone through um, a physical 
trauma, like a, I don't know, a, a war, an earthquake, yeah. a rape or something, it's over, but the trauma remains. And it's similar. In AA, they say, <laughs> they laugh and say, well, just because you put the plug in the jug doesn't mean that you're over the ism, the alcoholism. And whatever you brought to that addiction or that relationship remains, plus all the shame and low self-esteem and habits and and the emotions that go with it um, have to be healed. So it's I spent a lot of time afterwards. And not only that, you can get into another relationship that might be abusive in a different way. Um, or someone who's a distancer, or someone who's smothering you, um, yeah, or other kinds of trauma, and it re-triggers the old trauma. Sure. So then you have to go through it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully not all of it is intensive, but yeah. I, well, I, I found that generally, un and unfortunately, if you have one narcissist in your life, you probably have more than one. Or it's not like they just have one for your whole lifetime. But what is it? What would you say makes somebody uh, susceptible to attracting or ending up in a relationship with a narcissist? Who do they prey on, and how can people make sure they're they're not a target for these predators? Well, codependency is a prime. Uh, it's kind of a catch-all phrase for a yes. lot of traits that make you susceptible. Yeah. So depression might be one thing mm -hmm. because you tend to idealize someone else mm -hmm. when you're depressed and a narcissist, uh, often an abuser, doesn't have to be a narcissist, will um, try to be seductive be exciting, um, charming, uh, seduce you with love bombing and words and romance and sex. Yeah. And and a narcissist will brag and, and pump themselves up. So you're going to start to idealize them. Yeah, A little idealization is normal when you fall in love. Right, yeah. But you don't lose sight of negative traits. You still are able to see um, see through someone's um, romancing you or seduction because you're more connected to yourself. So mm -hmm. one of the problems with codependence is that they're not connected to themselves. They have dysfunctional boundaries, shame and low self-esteem. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But their boundaries are such that they're focused on other people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they don't see themselves well. Yeah. The narcissist is the reverse. They also have dysfunctional boundaries. But they don't see other people. All they see is themselves. Right. They project themselves onto other people. Yeah. And then they think they're great. They think they're number one. And codependents are people that are very empathic. Or maybe they were trained to put other people first, that it was selfish or conceited or whatever for religious or other reasons. Or just because their parents were controlling or narcissistic or demanding or self-centered mm. or into addicts or for a lot of different reasons. So they don't think that they deserve to be first. They would think that that's embarrassing, selfish, self-centered, and they will want to put the narcissist first. So there's a way which the narcissist and the codependent agree in the beginning. Yeah. The narcissist comes first. Yeah. And I mean, I kind of, um, yeah, I like what you said about being uh Connected or disconnected, I, I don't know if that's the term you use, but in terms of being connected to themselves or not, or I mean, I always think of it in terms of being connected to your higher power or not, because if we're connected to our higher power, then our self-esteem is good, we feel positive, and we're less likely to 
be so impressed with somebody who has it all together because you know narcissists really they put they're they're usually put together well you know their their outward appearance and how they come off is generally somewhat impressive that's why they end up you know that's why good people end up with them unfortunately research has shown that they had groups of people interviewing others and a narcissist uh, for 20 minutes over a period of weeks. It took seven meetings for people to see through the narcissist charm. Because yeah. in the beginning, they liked the narcissist. But yeah. after a while, they started. So if, <laughs> it usually happens before seven dates uh, that you're already... Uh, succumbed to, right you know so but if you wait longer uh you might see more however i mean more than disconnected in the way you were referencing i mean being connected to your feelings not just mm -hmm. your power because yeah. if you're typically another symptom of codependency is that People are in denial of their needs and their feelings. They're tuned into what you want, what you need, mm -hmm. how you're feeling. Trying to be hyper vigilant, maybe because they had to with a parent. Yeah. Like, did he like what I did? Did she not like what I said? Yeah. What kind of impression I'm going to make? Mm -hmm. And not paying attention to what you're feeling. Yeah. And so they get and especially if they're depressed too, they mistake mm -hmm. anxiety for excitement. That's another issue. They think, oh, the chemistry is wonderful and they feel this intensity. They don't realize they're anxious mm -hmm. <laughs> when the person is taking them out. They're mm -hmm. afraid of making a mistake. They're afraid, and here's another thing. Codependents have trouble being assertive about their needs yeah. and saying yeah. no. Yeah. setting boundaries so yeah. you know they go along to get along yeah a narcissist has no problem saying what they want saying what they yeah. don't want and a codependent is trained it's learned in childhood to not make waves to go along and so what are you doing you're training you're teaching the narcissist that they can get what they want when they want or the abuser and you'll just go along with it. Yeah. And then you maybe start to, a year later, say, wait a minute, I'm not getting my needs met. Yeah. And the narcissist says, you've changed. <laughs> what do you mean your needs? Right. It's about my needs. Yeah. So, but if you right. speak up in the beginning, they won't hang around. If you yeah. want to them to you know, take into consideration your schedule, your taste, what you like or don't like, or speak up when something bothers you or offends you. Yeah. They might for a little while, but if that continues, they're they're not going to stick around too long. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like what you're saying about disconnected. Right. And sort of, um, I guess you can throw in like self-awareness there and just yeah, knowing what you're feeling and why. Um, I think that's a little bit, um, that's the kind of thing people would might be in denial about. And then once you start doing the work, you kind of get it as you're doing the work. Cause, and, and I find that to be really difficult. I'm curious what you think when it comes to codependence, it seems like over the last couple of years, um, attachment theory has has taken off. And everyone wants to talk about and focus on attachment theory. And to some, you know, it's as if, or they're making as if I had like a, I don't think it was millennial or maybe a Gen Z person tell me like, oh no, there's no more codependence. It, it, it's all attachment theory. And I'm like, I did not agree with them, but <laughs> th th you know, they say these things and they pronounce them as, you know, how it could get sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's been a trend. Talk to us about your thoughts on attachment versus codependence 
and um, I don't know how, how to relate them to one another and, and how and why, you know, codependence is still something you need to right. pay attention yeah, to. I, I love talking about this because I Good. have a peeve about it too. There's a book about attachments that came out and how we all need attachment and attachment is good. And that's true. And how relationship can help you. And that's true. Except a codependent, they, it's like they haven't experienced a codependent relationship. Yeah. It doesn't help you. Yeah. It undermines, I mean, especially if there's abuse. I mean, there's some codependent relationships that can work. I have to have a caveat here. I had, um, I can remember friends of my parents, they're long dead, but in that generation, the wife looked up to the husband. He was a doctor. I think they called each other mother <laughs> and doctor or father. Yeah. And she just, you know, took a subservient role to her husband and it worked for both of them. And they, yeah. and it was not, it was, he wasn't abusive. So, yeah. but generally speaking, it's a one-sided relationship and the person who is more subservient doesn't get their needs met, doesn't even know what they are and doesn't speak up for them. So one of the things that makes you susceptible to an abusive relationship is having grown up in that environment. Yeah. Codependency is learned where you learn that you're not important, that you don't matter. And I wrote a whole book on shame <laughs> conquering shame and codependency and that abandonment trauma in childhood when you don't feel that you matter um, and the mother and father can't attune to you it's all about them they may not be narcissists but maybe they don't have time mm -hmm. or they weren't didn't learn how to nurture and yeah so, you know, you come to adult relationships already having suffered a trauma. Just because you leave the abusive relationship, you haven't done the healing, you know, you'll go back into another one. And I have clients that have multiple yes. Yes. relationships where it may not be physical. Maybe first it was physical abuse and then it was verbal abuse. And then it was just someone, you know, ignoring them. I mean, the relationships improve over time. But they're really not We're human. Worse yeah. And I want to say something else about this too. Codependents have the belief. First of all, they put relationships first. They prioritize relationships. Yes. And abusers, particularly narcissists, prioritize power. So they're on different paths. And a narcissist will sacrifice the relationship to be number one to have power codependent because they prioritize relationships and they idealize love and they will sacrifice themselves for the relationship. So you can see how they're at cross purposes here. So a codependent thinks if they're loved, they're lovable. That's a mistake. You're lovable because you're a human <laughs> Mm. But they didn't get that unconditional love in their childhood, mo more than likely. Mm -hmm. Maybe the parents said, I love you, but it's more than that. And I go into this in my book on shame. You have to feel that both parents, not just one, love you for who you are. Yeah. That they're interested in you, in your interests, and in having a relationship with you. It's not about just telling you, spending time with you and lecturing to you or that you have to have good grades or whatever, yeah. be pretty thin, uh, a good athlete, that they accept you for who you are. And that makes you feel lovable. So mm -hmm. underneath codependency is this shame that mm -hmm. I really, you're, most people are not in touch with this. Most mm. people don't talk about shame. They don't know they have shame. I didn't. <laughs> I was teaching classes on self-esteem and I didn't know that I had shame underneath. So, so they have this belief 
that if I'm loved, I'll be lovable. So what do they do? They try to make people love them. I will please you. I will do what you want. I will go along with you. I will, you know, all these things. And then maybe you'll love me. And that's what they do in the relationship with an abuser. Yeah. I don't want to, and it's compounded because they don't like conflict. They can't set boundaries. So I don't want to make waves. I'm going to go along and appease you and please you. And then maybe you'll love me. And all that does is feed into the narcissist self-centeredness. And they get, you're teaching them to be more self-centered. You're yeah. teaching them that you're needless. Mm -hmm. And you don't care. You're just going to try harder and try harder. And guess what? Yeah. A narcissist uh, is like a bottomless pit, like a vampire. Yeah. They have... Uh, you know, you have to feed them constantly. Yep. Their emptiness is underneath. They're empty until you're drained and you are exhausted and you're bankrupt emotionally, physically, <clears throat> emotionally. Yeah. Your health cycle. Yeah. The other thing with codependency is, that, so like when I think of, um, well, when I think of my, my parents, were they were polar opposites. They couldn't be more different, but when you have opposites and you're in completion that they had different strengths and together they made one functional person, one healthy functional person. And that, and those kind of relationships. Yeah. Like my parents got 52 years, which is remarkable considering mm -hmm. my mom's an angel. My dad's a narcissist, but, but op that's an indicator. I feel like if you see opposites, it's more likely to be codependent than similar people. It's kind of what I think because they're 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 completing one another in that regard. Well, that's another sometimes, thing. not every time, but yeah, but that could be the scenario. Um, in my book on narcissism, dating, loving, and leaving a narcissist, yes. I have a chapter on. First of all, I think narcissists are codependent too. Yes, <laughs> probably in the minority there. But there was a. Oh no, they are. Yeah. They need somebody. They need somebody. Mm -hmm. They need yeah. a fan club, yeah. and they need a head fan. They need like a head fan of their fan club. And I go into detail on how all of the um, main traits, uh, symptoms of codependency, are in the narcissist and codependent, but they may manifest differently. For instance, uh, a codependent might feel shame and they might then idealize someone else or uh, not feel good about themselves. The narcissist has a lot of shame too, but instead they brag and they do impression management and, yeah. you know, they, like you said, they need a, to be validated all the time. So, and they both have dysfunctional boundaries. I also stated how they're, both dysfunctional, but they're opposite. They both have impaired self-esteem. Uh, codependent doesn't think highly of himself. A narcissist is unrealistically inflated with himself. Well, healthy self-esteem is balanced. Yes. You accept your strengths and your weaknesses. And so uh, since codependents really don't like to be bold and risk-taking, and before the camera, for instance, and getting all the attention, they rather be behind the scenes, usually uh, work in a, um, a group or a, be in a corporate setting or something like that. A narcissist wants to be number one. They're mm -hmm. bold, they're leaders, they take action, they want to be in the limelight. So these are things that the codependent lacks. In fact, I had a dream that I needed to be more narcissistic. <laughs> so you need to develop those in yourself. And then you don't idealize and just want to be in the shadow of somebody who's the yeah. life of the party. Yeah. So you, that's kind of what you're saying. Those, they're kind of disowned there's a term for it, disowned traits. Mm. So what you disown, you'll attract. 
Mm. So another another example is a lot of codependents, not all, but are very uncomfortable with anger. Maybe they were punished for anger mm -hmm. or they had a, a, a raging parent and they don't want to be like that mm -hmm. or for religious reasons. For, there are many reasons that they uh, are not comfortable expressing their anger. So it doesn't yeah. mean they don't have anger. They may, may not be a, aware of it. I remember in my 20s, it would if someone insulted me, I might not get angry for two weeks. <laughs> so it took me a while to catch up so what do you do you attract i attracted an angry husband mm -hmm. and i confused that was i thought he was strong <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I, that's a great point i because i think um a lot of what you hear um you know the last couple of years has been a lot of talk of female and masculine energy and how the female wants a provider and protector and leader and women, you gotta be careful. <laughs> like I understand yeah. you want a provider and a protector yeah, and someone leader, who wants, Someone who wants to take care of you, be careful yeah. because that can lead to control. It can lead to ownership. Yeah. yeah. And I have clients that regret that they gave up their apartment, they gave up their job, and then yep. they became totally dependent Maybe they went into quote unquote business with the boyfriend, narcissist, mm -hmm. and then they had nothing. And they couldn't, they wanted to leave. Yeah. They had no money, yeah. no resources. Well, well, they think their business partners and the narcissist thinks they're an assistant. Oh, yeah, exactly. They're, they're not really like valuing yeah, no, the work in the company. Exactly. They just they just do whatever I tell them to do. Yeah. You know? Um, but yeah, I was just gonna say on the uh, attachment and and um versus codependence is that if you do not, if you fix your codependence, you will end up with a secure attachment style. Yeah, I have, right? a, I have a blog. Yeah, going back to that, I have a blog that says how to change your, co your attachment style. You just recover from codependency. Th there it is, exactly. And that's been my thing. And it's been a little bit frustrating with the younger people so obsessed about attachment but they've been using it the way they've been using it is let's say we meet right and i i'm like oh you know what so i have an anxious attachment style so i need you to reassure me often like that's how they're using it as opposed to working on themselves to create a secure attachment they're kind of using it to, yeah, to right. tell the other person and and right. Generally speaking, codependents have insecure attachment style. Yeah. Now, one way to um, heal that, aside from recovery, is being in a relationship with someone who has a secure attachment style. But that's not what happens. <laughs> right. So, right. usually a pursuer attracts a distancer. And I have blogs yeah. about that. I go into the dynamics of that in my book on shame, because it's both is driven by shame and underneath that is emptiness. Yeah. And, and the disown, the distancer, we touched on disown parts of yourself. The distancer is actually um, needs to be more in touch with their, the part of them that wants connection and closeness. Mm -hmm. And the pursuer needs to develop their autonomous side. Mm -hmm. Each is kind of a mirror image of the other's unconscious. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what you said about being taken care of, it reminded me, I once went out with a man who seemed great, like on the surface, and we're at a restaurant, and he started chew, really rudely chewing out the hostess. Oh, geez. Or something. She They misplaced his credit card or something. And what was really scary, he was smiling the whole time he was insulting her. Oh God! And my blood when I really got oh, chills. Jeez, right? And I said to him, "I said you're." Um, I didn't know what to say. I said you're showing me another side of yourself. Yeah, uh, people. Yeah. People what he said, though, they are. What he said was very interesting. He said, "Oh, most women feel protected. They like that." That was yeah. 
that was the end for me. Yeah. I didn't want to be on the other side of that. So that's a warning sign when you see people like rude, you know, they're <laughs> eventually they'll be rude to you. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. If, but if if you haven't had great love relationships or relationships in your life and you fix your codependence, all your relationships get so much better that you can't yeah. like you can't believe it. You know, I, I have some blogs on how your attachment style affects your relationships. And statistically, unfortunately, most people with secure relationships are already in insecure, secure attachment style are already in secure relationships. Right. So when you're single, you're more likely to date someone with an insecure attachment style or an avoidant. So it's a little, you know, it's, right. you have to be careful. There, there are good people out there, but it's going to be harder. Uh, you know, I have to take your time to yes. to someone. And the other thing is, remember what I said about mistaking anxiety for excitement? Yeah. Um, so when you get recovered or in recovery and you start dating healthier people, you'll probably be bored. Yes. That's a good point. And you'll think because there's less drama. Because Where there are, are the fireworks? Yeah. Yep. Don't pass up those people because those are a relationship is not supposed to be highs and lows like that. It's exactly. supposed to be steady, consistent, reliable, caring. So that's the yep. other, you know, susceptible and, and, and uh, yeah. Trait is that most codependents are people that are in abusive relationships, they have never felt safe and they probably don't even know it because, you know, fish doesn't know they're in water, right? Yeah. So they're used to trouble. They're used yep. to angst, anxiety, worry, you know, about the relationship and thinking about the relationship. A good relationship, you're not thinking about it all the time. It's just, it's like, you're not always checking if your watch is working, you know, it just works. Once exactly. in a while, you clean it, you change the battery. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you have to give yourself uh, time and it starts with self-love. And the more you love yourself, uh, the more you will attract someone loving and not put yeah. up with anyone who is disrespectful of you because we, you know, you'll leave a abusive relationship and then guess what? You're still living with an abuser and it's you. Yeah. So that's the hard work yeah. is really learning to love yourself. When yeah. you never were nurtured, you have to figure that out. Yep. And it takes time, but it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding. And, and support. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. You know, I think a lot of codependents tend to go fast too. And and a lot of people also complain about in their time wasted because they have a one or two good dates and they go all in with that person and then they realize it's not a fit and then they wasted that time. Or this person is so amazing, but then years later he's the controller who took advantage of them but, and everything else. But, take but going time. fast like that shows that they're desperate. If they're not, the, the main thing is to have a life that you enjoy. Yes. And then yeah. a partner adds to it. Yeah. You don't need, you don't feel like you have to have a relationship to uh, be happy. That's another thing. A relationship isn't going to make you happy or unhappy. Right. You are responsible for your happiness and unhappiness. So that's a myth too. Yeah. So find someone to love me, then I'll be happy. Yeah, I like to say get to yourself to a loving place where you're feeling like where you're where you're feeling love energy and your authentic self and then go on a, and and consider that being in love and then see if you could be with that other person and still be in love meaning that they don't that if anything they elevate you but they don't take you out of it kind of thing um it is is what i try to teach people so you have to be patient because yeah. like i said if you're single the odds are kind of against you. Yeah. So you're going to have to date, you know, a lot of frogs before you find a prince. <laughs> and 
if you rush into something, it's going to be harder to get out. Mm -hmm. You're going to take your time, go slow, and stay connected to yourself. To and go, speak out. Keep your boundaries. The person. Yes, of course, it's exciting when, when you first meet, of course, but try to breathe and get to know. <laughs> so, Darlene, before we go there, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? You want to remind us again where we can find your blog, your books? Sure. Um, anything free? What do you have? What do you have for us? What do you have for everyone? Well, <laughs> some of my uh, blogs at my website, and you can sign up for to get it monthly as an email. Uh, is what is codependency.com, and I write monthly. Love it. I just wrote a blog on uh, our narcissists made or born. Next month, I'm doing one on emotional incest and what that is mm -hmm. and how the effects of it. So uh, there's that. And I'm on YouTube and um, I have uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Pinterest, and there's all links on my website or you can just Google and, my name. And your website is? What is codependency.com? There it is. What is codependency? If you forget that, just my name, you'll find me. Okay. And if you need an answer, what is codependency.com? Right. Find and your books on Amazon. All my books are workbooks. So they're all okay. the first one I wrote was 10 Steps of Self-Esteem, which is now a webinar, uh, how to raise your self-esteem. And then I wrote uh how to be assertive, how to because assertiveness and self-esteem have a synergistic relationship. When you speak, you like, for instance, you go on an interview for a job, how you speak reflects your self-esteem. And when you improve your ability to be assertive, and that includes boundaries, yourself, it raises your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So you, those things are learned, and you can do that. You could take a class in it, you could do it on your own, you could do the workbooks that I have and all these things are learned so it takes effort like you're learning a new language and then I have books on overcoming perfectionism uh, overcoming guilt because those are all typical things that codependents deal with and one on yeah. um, the working the 12 steps mm. um, so that's all there and I have a media page with links to all my talks and videos and things like that. And you can get the 14 tips for letting go and self-love meditation on my website and the soul alignment meditation. Because when you're in an unhappy relationship, your soul is not in alignment for sure. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Thank you for, thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, that was great. Uh, there it is. Darlene Lancer, 